Hello, everyone, and welcome to SeaWorld Strategy Webinar today. Thanks for joining in with us today. I appreciate that. Today, we're going to talk, take a look at the seed-specific tools available to producers and uh, for battling insects and best management practices to protect those technologies. My name is Sean Brook, and I am the president of SeaWorld Media, and I'm going to serve as your moderator today. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, uh, BASF and Bear Crop Science. A few housekeeping items that I just need to make a note of. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on SeedWorld.com following the event. For audio quality purposes, all microphones have been muted with the exception of the speakers. And please, if you have any questions or comments at all, share them in the chat box at the bottom, and we'll make note of them and make sure we get them over to our speakers, which they will share their insights on. So a quick rundown on how things are going to go. Uh, first, we'll hear from uh, Dwayne Rule of Dow AgriScience on traits available to help protect against insects and uh, some trait stewardship concepts. Uh, we'll then hear from Greg Ginnifty of Bear Crop Science on battling insects via seed applied technologies. And then following that, we're going to open up to, uh, to those questions for both Dwayne and Greg to wrap up the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. We start with uh, Dwayne Rule believes uh, backing farmers with the best science is key to producing sustainable global food supply, and he's enthused to be part of the solution. Um, Dwayne is at Dow AgriScience and has been instrumental in the company's biotechnology efforts to advance corn technology. He develops research programs that predict product performance and durability in order to bring farmers insect-resistant crops that are better able to protect themselves from pests. He's focused on breakthrough uh, technology that is effective and also convenient for farmers to use, which enhances a sustainable approach to production. An example of a key product he helped bring to market is the company's Refuge Advance powered by Smart Tracks. <laughs> Smart Stacks. Sorry about that, Dwayne. Um, Rule also holds diverse membership in such professional organizations as the Weed Seed Society of America, North Central Weed Science Society of America, Crop Science Society of America entomological uh, society of america and american society society of agronomy so we've got an expert on our hands um we then uh, uh, we'll hear from uh, greg guinnesty who has a bachelor's degree in economics from duke university and has worked in several positions in sales marketing finance supply chain in france germany and the u.s he joined bear in france in 1999 started working in the seed treatment business unit in 2010, and in 2014, Greg relocated to the U.S. with family for his current position as product manager for Bayer Seed Growth. So welcome, gentlemen, and welcome to our audience. Um, we're going to dive right in, and I am going to uh, transfer control over to, uh, to Dwayne Rule. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to most of everyone. Uh, again, my name is Dwayne Rule. I work for Dagger Sciences in their insect trait development. And I uh, wanted to take this opportunity today to uh, divest into a little bit more on protecting your yield performance from corn rootworm. Uh, that is the focus for today's presentation. However, we'll, we'll be happy to uh, entertain any questions for soybeans or cotton or other crops uh, best possible. Um, but this is a, uh, we're open to discussions today. Uh, moving forward here, overview, overview of the presentation today is uh, again on corn rootworm current status, the management practices, uh, some recent performance summaries, and then uh, dive in a little bit of introduction on some new technology coming to pipeline. First, I want everybody to sit back and uh, look at the assessment of their corn rootworm risk. And when I put this presentation together, I really was thinking about the group and, and where I come from, uh, come from a agronomy background, uh, cut my teeth on corn rootworm, uh, dealing with a master's in entomology. And then I spent uh, several years as a seed agronomist and working with to promote seed traits, uh, seed genetics, and uh, working with growers and the retailers alike that are on this call today. So, most importantly, I want to start out with just looking at the overall map here displayed of corn root infestation and revisit that. So, the light orange depicts the overall majority part of the areas that have corn root infestation. Um, highlighted here. As you look into the, the, the dark red, 
or Burgundy, that would be the greatest impact. That's in our Corn Belt. That's where we see year in, year out, economic detriment from this pest. Uh, we've also got the introduction of the soybean variant there in the mid-90s in the, in the purple, uh, mainly covering the Illinois, Indiana, parts of Ohio, uh, the southern parts of Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and now also moving over into uh, eastern Iowa now. The blue here would be the northern corn rootworm or extended diapause, and that really encompasses that southern Minnesota, uh, parts of South Dakota, Nebraska, main portion there of Iowa, and also moving over into Illinois and Wisconsin. I would probably, if I was to update this slide, would be to move that blue over into farther east into northern Illinois, as we've looked at here in recent years. But we can go back and revisit this slide if we need to to address any specific, specific questions. Okay, our current status here in North America on rootworm, mainly the U.S., uh, first begin off here just northern corn rootworm. So it's been a pretty quiet pest for the past 10 years. Uh, isolated instances of, of, this, of this pest have emerged. Uh, however, I would say we've got some isolated increases uh, beginning about 2013 and 14. And that really comes back from the winter of 2012 and 13, a very harsh winter, uh, very detrimental to the survival of western corn rootworm eggs and that population in those areas due to the really cold uh, temperatures, a uh, deep freeze in the soil was, uh, was harmful to those eggs. Uh, and then it led into the spring of 2013 where much of uh, southern Minnesota, Iowa, did have a lot of delayed planting. Um, and therefore there wasn't a lot of roots for those larvae to feed on and therefore starve for westerns. What that did was it allowed a northern corn rootworm, which typically emerges or hatches a little bit later than westerns, um, to flourish and survive and not have that competition of westerns uh, in those mixtures. We've typically seen a lot of uh, mixture of western and northern in these areas, but now it seems like we've got some really hot spots of some northerns in that parts of uh, northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, and now uh, more over into Wisconsin and northern Illinois. So definitely something to keep our eye on and think about if we had a population of 2013 uh, northern corn rootworm, being this extended diapause, I mean, it's going to be delayed a year for it to hatch, that uh, 2015 would have been a peak year. And if we would have had uh, a high population 2014, that would lead us to think that we'd have a, maybe a concern here in 2016 uh, season here for northern corn rootworm. So it goes back to that field history, thinking back to what we were dealing with in our pre prior years, to understand what we might be dealing with as we look in here in 2016. The next species I want to talk about is the western corn rootworm, and that's where I'll probably focus a lot of my attention here today. This is one of our most challenging populations we deal with. Um, we are dealing with a mosaic of, of the stability of this species to all of our BT traits. It has been reported that we do have cry three resistance and cross resistance, and that really goes back to our products uh, 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 from industry, um, the Cry3B and M Cry3A and E Cry3.1, uh, those are the proteins that are all involved in this. Uh, these are incidents that have been developing year on year, but have been developing rather by field by field than on an area wide basis, meaning it goes back to how that field was managed uh, in that year and prior years that led up to that. It really goes back to that corn-on-corn -corn situation, continued use, and I'll get to a little more of that here in a second. But with those cry three developments there in the early part of this decade, 2009, 10, 11, 12, growers are now moving towards a pyramided approach, and they're, they're selecting products uh, with a 3, 4, 3, 5. And therefore, we now have a kind of a more or less what I call a reduction in cry three problems are being reported. So growers are not planting this a single cry three product. They're planting a product with a... Uh, 3435 three, protein in there, a Herculex rootworm, if you will, um, in these cry three areas. And what that does is puts tremendous selection pressure on that cry 3435 protein, um, which we need to be, pay attention to. Since these recent years, growers have been using these, pro these pyramid proteins. Um, we have experienced some limited number of unexpected damage reports in these areas. And we really attribute this to high pressure. Um, and these areas of reduced performance to cry three. 
So if you have a reduced performance of a cry 3 protein on these specific, within this specific species, uh, in, this pop, in these populations, uh, your really the only protein working could be a 34-35. Now, as I mentioned previously, we have a mosaic of, of what I call reduced susceptibility in these fields. And what that means is, is not all the, the individual insects or, or larvae uh, that are hatching out are all have reduced, reduced sensitivity to these, to the, these proteins. Therefore, we still do see value in these CRY3 uh, proteins in these pyramids. So we're still seeing these pyramids as the go-to product to manage corn rootworm. Now, with that said, with the high selection pressure, this does emphasize the need to steward these hybrids expressing the cryo 3435 to reduce that risk of resistant development. We don't want to lose any more uh, tools in the toolbox. So let's revisit here quickly a little background on rootworm. So these BT hybrids uh, that express these proteins for rootworm control have been very successful tools to manage rootworm populations going back over 10 years, going back to 2003, uh, when CRY3B1 was first introduced. In the mid-2000s, mid it was a very successful uh, adoption rate um, in these areas. And now we have these challenging populations. And like I alluded to before, it's due to this high selection pressure, widespread use of a single mode of action, uh, continuous corn. I don't think anyone predicted back in two, uh, you know, over 10, 15 years ago that we would have this much continuous corn production we do today, and uh, therefore that's led to the you know, high selection rate that we are putting on to these proteins, but a single kind of a control tactic for rootworm. Um, in the early years where we had a, the 20% the separate refuge, we did not have stellar compliance with refuge compliance on these products. Uh, you know, in a reaction to that, uh, industry as a whole move towards the ref blended refuge or refuge in a bag, and uh, that's really helped uh, guarantee that compliance and to maintain a refuge to help reduce uh, that resistance development. Also, when we move into this, we had a slower adoption of these BT corn products, and, and that really comes back to in these pyramids where we had the singles for about 10 years, and then we started moving into the pyramids. Growers were not as apt to move into a pyramid because they felt very comfortable they were getting the value out of their single. That just kind of extended that selection pressure uh, of these singles uh, towards these single proteins. When growers did have a problem, they were a little bit slow to change their management strategy. So they saw you know, a few large plants out there or saw a few too many beetles. They weren't as quick to, to, to change their strategy to manage the pest. You know, it's kind of one of those... Uh, let's just keep planting. It's working, and it will will change when it fails. Well, now we've got wide, you know, some really hot spots that are very difficult to manage. So, um, leading here in this last point is our future plan really needs to adopt a rural manager strategy with more integrated and sustainable system. Meaning, we've got to reduce that resistance selection pressure, and we can keep using these traits uh, and and be sustainable in using these traits if we integrate other control tactics and cultural practices to maintain this. So let's think about how we would develop a sustainable system. And that really is when the first thing is to assess the risk. So think of a grower, think of your customer out there that has rootworm. Think of that field or a scenario where he's been corn on corn and what type of proteins have been expressing in the hybrids that that grower has been planting and assess what that field history has been, what's been visible in that field from aspect of performance. Has anyone looked at that field? Has anyone walked that field and looked for, you know, root damage, looked for beetle presence in high numbers? Have that, has that field had to have been sprayed the previous year for silk clipping? Those are all triggers to say that we've got some, you know, high numbers of investations out there. In these scenarios, we need to be using these root worm management practices. And that's where we want to rotate. Rotate is the, the number one tool to help us break the life cycle of the corn rootworm, uh, meaning that these eggs overwinter in the soil. If we, there is no host plant there, which is soybeans or another alternate crop that is not corn, that these larvae will hatch and, 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 and starve and die. So if we can rotate, we can break that cycle, reduce the overall population. It's the number one tool we can use. 
Now, we do have areas where we have the rotation variant, where rotation is not as, as, as successful, meaning that these uh, corn rootworm adults will fly out of cornfields and lay eggs in bean fields and other, and other crops uh, because they, where they feed, they lay eggs. And so if they're feeding on a little bit of soybean tissue, uh, they will lay eggs in those soybean fields. In the fall and subsequent year, uh, it could be corn, that's where you would have that problem. And that's still something we need to pay attention to. It has to be addressed at a field-by-field -field level. Uh, next point here is to control those host plants. Use a herbicide program to control that volunteered corn and grassy weeds that could serve as a host for larvae and also attract those adult rootworm beetles. Uh, I can't think of a better scenario than to have a, a volunteer corn in a soybean field that would not serve as a late season alternate host to attract adult rootworm uh, uh, beetles to where they would feed on those corn leaves and then the eggs in those fields as well. And this can happen across Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, anywhere where you may not even have a, a, uh, a rotation variant present. Next would be is to select the right trait package. And there's several scenarios you want to think about here, but always think back to what, what, at what time do we need to be triggering this crop rotation. But when you look at the slick trait package, when you're moving to a trait package, assess that risk of do you have low to moderate pressure. That's where you can go in there with a, a Smart Stax, which is a product that has the 34 or 35 in it, or Herculex rootworm, as well as a Cry 3. And this will work in any of these, area, in any of these environments. Um, as you, as you move into a high pressure scenario, uh, again, rotation will be first, but then thinking about the genetics you have, leading into a smart stacks with multiple modes of action uh, would be preferred. If you're in areas where you've had a prior history of unexpected damage or concern of potential uh, risk of resistance to a BT trait for rootworm, um, this is where you'd want to first consider rotation, but then if you don't have that option, consider alternate control in combination with that, with that BT. And there's a number of things that can allude to this. It could be a soil insecticide, chemigation, cetoplatin insecticide, adulticide, meaning you're spraying for adults in those areas, or just use an alternative trait. Now, our options for alternative traits are very slim at this point, as I've already alluded to, um, but something they need to consider. Uh, all these extra things can provide additional protection for the root, but they're not always going to be the best for resistance management. So they'll help to keep that plant vertical, uh, help keep maybe protect that yield, um, but the paybacks have been variable. But if it could be something to get by on on a few acres until you can, can get a plan in place to get a handle on your rootworm population. And this is where I would want everyone to uh, talk to their seed advisor, to their agronomist and get a better handle on what is the value of the payback or the value needed to, uh, to, to provide additional control to their uh, rootworm product, uh, traded product out there in the fields. Lastly here is they could use a non-rootworm product, uh, which could be a power core, which is Dowder Sciences launching power core, which is a, an above ground only product. Um, we can put that with us on insecticide with it and, and using these areas of what I call low pressure. So uh, something that would be available out there, there are other products in the market that do just have above ground BT protection for lepidopter control, and those will also be good options as well. No matter what tactic you use, we need to monitor all these populations. I got a little bit to before, assess that risk, not only prior season, during season, but also into the season. Um, we've got to scout, we've got to assess the need to spray for uh, adult control, Anything we can do to help understand what type of pressure we're dealing with and how can we lower the pressure for the following year and overall selection pressure on our BT traits. And at last here, we definitely have to plant that refuge. If you're not planting a, a blended refuge product, plant that separate refuge, get in those fields. We have guidelines. We have uh, EPA mandated requirements for our insect resistant management plans. Um, and these are all in your product use guides across any trait package you might have across the industry. For those on the phone that would know me, they probably know I can't do a presentation without showing some type of a data slide here. And so well, we'll go in here and look at some recent performance data for rootworm protection traits. And what I have here is nodal injury uh, on corn roots. And, and on the y-axis, I have the Iowa State scale, um, the 0 to 3, 0 meaning no damage, 3 meaning 3 nodes removed off that plant. 
Um, so that route was pretty much devastated at that point. And then on the x-axis, we've got uh, three different groups of bar graphs, and these are different groups of years in which we evaluated in different environments and under different populations. Uh, so we have the, the, the far left group is the 2007 to 2011 years. Uh, this is basically the development of smart stacks in those years. Uh, and we do have in here a, a non-BT, a, a cryo-3B a, uh, a cry hybrid, a 3435 hybrid, and also smart stacks. Um, everything's performing very well from a, from a BT standpoint. No concerns there, performing as expected at launch there in 2011. Um, moving into to the, the middle bar here, we have 2012 to 2014. Uh, these, are, these are the years we started hearing some reports resistance. These are field locations that had no prior problems. Okay, so we went to areas where we knew there was no uh, issues with any BT performance. And again, we see, you know, as pre expected performance. Now the pressure is very high here. I got to compliment uh, our university collaborators and our, uh, our our field scientists out there that established these trials. They get very good pressure and very uh, reliable data for us to analyze with. So we have very high pressure here, and smart is again performing very well, as well as the single traits. Do see a little bit of ele elevated feeding on uh, some of the singles. So that could be this variability within these trials. Uh, also a note here, we do have a non-BT uh, with a soil insecticide in that light green bar. Uh, that's a granular uh, insecticide uh, applied in a T-band and uh, providing as expected, but not always as stellar and as, and as consistent as what we might see out of a BT trait. But it is an option for growers out there. So again, like I said before, that would work under what I call a moderate to low type environment on a, when you're dealing with a non-BT. The far right group of, of bar graphs is our 2012 and 14 data, and these are in areas that have a prior history of a CRY-3 problem. Uh, these are areas that what I call extreme pressure, um, very, very uh, high pressure in these areas. Uh, focus on here, we are seeing some elevated feeding on our single traits. Uh, we can, can see where the CRY-3B uh, or CRY-3 product is, is, or is and during uh, an injury above a one node, which would put it in the unexpected damage uh, level. Uh, the the non-BT with the soil insecticide also has uh, uh, above the economic level here for uh, for injury at, at about 75 or about three quarters of a node uh, removed. Um, Herculex and smart stacks are providing uh, economic protection in these areas. Again, this is what I would call extreme pressure. Uh, not too many growers are going to see as much pressure, but it gives you an idea of the, of the value that these traits are going to play into. And, you know, there's her, the, the Herculex and the smart stacks are very close, but we still do see that benefit of the smart stacks with that Cry3B. There is some value of that 3B in that product. Going back to that point I made earlier, we have a mosaic of in this population where there still are cry three susceptible individuals in these environments, and so we still see value from that protection. But I think growers should be confident that they still have value in using these pyramided products, uh, any cry three plus A34 or 35 in their grower fields. Briefly show a little bit of yield performance data. Uh, again, these are in the 2012-2014 uh, time frame, and these are in locations in the left group here. Is, again, no prior problems. The right group would be with prior uh, cry three problems. And these bar graphs are in reference to the yield gain compared to the non-BT with no insecticide. So it's the yield gain on that uh, y-axis. And so we are seeing, again, consistent protection from uh, the small insecticide, the, the single and small stacks, uh, small stacks being incrementally better here uh, in these non-problem areas. That eight to 10 bushels, um, over over the top of a soil insecticide on non-BT is what we expect uh, in those areas. As you move into these problem areas, this is where we start to, in these high pressure, we start to see things separate out a little bit, and that's where we see smart stacks uh, yield gains, uh, you know, being significantly increasing here over the non-BT with no protection, but also the non-BT with a soil insecticide and, of course, a Herculex Extra. Uh, so we've seen that the growers can see that value uh, when they start uh, pulling those uh, 
combines in the field to harvest. So in summary here, well, for this data set here from 2007 to 2015, uh, we are seeing that smart techs provide that the greatest protection, uh, both in root protection, also yield protection in these areas of, of cry three and non cry three problem areas. Uh, the non-BT with a swollen cichlid may not provide that optimal yield protection compared to a BT hybrid in these high pressure situations. Continue to use a single mode of action in these areas and corn on corn can increase the, resist, the risk for resistance development, um, could potentially reduce that yield potential and uh, also add to the need for additional insecticide use, either soil or foliar applied. And again, it's that the whole resistant development, uh, we're trying to, to, to delay that as much as we can. So growers that use the smart stacks hybrids and, and implement uh, best management practices uh, will gain benefits uh, within rootworm management, yield protection, and IRM. And lastly here, uh, power core technology will be a viable option in uh, low corn room pressure areas and may be, still be providing that above ground insect protection. So following up here with the agro-science strategy for corn traits here in North America, we are, our goal here is to provide growers elite genetics with insect protection options, going in here with small stacks, uh, fully loaded uh, rootworm protection, or power core, which would give them above ground protection uh, with the ability to and use this technology in, uh, in low to, 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 to no rootworm areas. Utilize our refuge advanced technology to provide that blended refuge for refuge compliance. Uh, also introducing here our new herbicide tolerance traits, which is again the enlist weed control system. This is going to help uh, bring a valuable tool to help control weeds, weeds that could be late season attractants to uh, for adult insects, uh, or adult rootworm beetles, uh, needless to say, but also keep uh, those fields free from uh, weed free from weed weed yield loss systems. As an industry, we were all aligned with the one well, work with customers consultants extension to basically implement these best management practices prior to the development of resistance and manage these pest populations. And uh, that all revolves around this insect resistance management strategies compatible with an integrated pest management foundation is really where we're moving into. As we uh, think about here in the next generation, I want to go into what we're introducing is SmartStacks Pro technology, which will, will provide the next generation rootworm management. And that's where I'll move into next. So SmartStacks Pro technology uh, will be the first uh, technology to offer three modes of action uh, against corn room control. Uh, we will continue to have the uh, CRY-3435 in it and with the addition of a new event, a MON-8741. So Dow has uh, licensed this event from Monsanto, which is considered the Rootworm 3 event, and it is a CRY-3B1 plus an RNAi gene um, that targets a specific protein uh, within that insect uh, that causes a, a, lethal, a lethal, uh, lethal dose there. This uh, consists of that novel RNAi, which targets uh, the later season larval management, and so it provides that full season control. Um, the plan is that this will extend the durability uh, of, of resistance development and help protect the 34, 35, um, and also help us manage those cry three uh, reduced sensitive populations out there. This will all be a refuge blended enabled system, so it will be refuge advanced. This is going to be an additional tool for farmers to help them manage the rootworm pressure and continue to implement the rootworm best management practices. This will be a targeted launch at the end of the decade pending regulatory approval. Like I mentioned, we, uh, this is a, a license from Monsanto, so we just successfully uh, completed our third year collaboration of evaluating our field trials. Uh, this will be for root protection efficacy as well as adult emergence. And, uh, you know, this will be a new rootworm management technology for rootworm. Uh, this is the only new mode of action for rootworm that will be launched within the next decade. Again, I'm going to say again, this will be the only new mode of action that we'll have against rootworm in the next decade. So uh, we have to protect our 34, 35, and this is one of the new tools that will enable us to do that. Uh, this is just a picture here from this last year in Illinois. We've got a non-BT on the left and a Smart Stacks Pro, that S. XP on the right, um, showing excellent control in this uh, given CRY3 uh, problem area. 
And uh, yes, Illinois does have uh, some rootworm pressure in that state still. So even after the floods this last year. Dagger Science has had an aggressive pipeline. Uh, we're very excited with our discovery pipeline. Uh, as I get to work cross-functionally with this team and, and get to advance uh, new traits, uh, we are working on uh, up to eight new traits right here displayed. Um, these are for a lepidoptera and rootworm traits. So very excited at where those are going to come to market um, very soon. But again, we're excited about where SmartStacks Pro is and moving forward. We do have other technologies listed here. Uh, we've got our uh, concussive soybeans listed for Latin America um, and also our, our cotton here uh, moving forward as well. And that's where I'll end today uh, with this particular session. I'll be happy to again to answer any questions you might have uh, during the, uh, the, the last uh, open panel part of this uh, webinar. Now in there, thank you. Dwayne, thanks very much for that. I appreciate that. I want to remind everyone that uh, please keep any questions that you have flowing in. Uh, utilize the chat box down at the bottom of your screen. They'll be submitted, and then, as uh, Dwayne just said, at the end of this uh, process, we will walk through some questions. So uh, without further ado, I am now going to turn over control to uh, Greg Ginnisky from Bayer Crop Science, and we'll walk through his presentation. And again, at the end of that, we'll, we'll uh, answer some questions. Greg, go ahead and turn that over to you. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, so battling insects is the topic for today, and it's an important topic for growers. Um, I've been out to uh, St. Louis and Indianapolis the last two days, and definitely there's a cold spell going through the country, but it's been a pretty mild winter so far. And if this continues, we may see uh, higher insect pressure come spring. So it's, uh, it's quite a good, uh, good timing for this session. And um, we do have several tools available to growers to protect their crops against insects. Um, ranging from chemicals, forest crop rotation, and then genetics. Um, so far, we've been pretty lucky in the world of, uh, of insecticides because we have quite effective solutions um, available to growers. But as Dwayne mentioned, it's important to remind the growers on the solutions and the best management practices so that we continue to have working solutions. So today I'd like to, uh, to give you some more insight on the seed apply technology um, part of this. We'll start off with a quick intro on why seed treatments. And um, seed treatments are a great tool for growers to protect their crops. They're efficient, they're easy to use, and they offer a low environmental load. So let me drive maybe on those three points. Efficient. Well, efficient because every plant is protected. With the current application technology, we're able to bring each seed the required product to protect it. Easy to use because the grower doesn't have to manipulate jugs with chemicals. You've got professional applicators that take care of applying the product to the seed, and the grower simply plants it. And seed treatments enable us to apply less active per acre versus foliar sprays and in fertile application, whilst maintaining the same protection leading to a lower environmental load. We see seed treatments as, uh, in, many, in many cases, complementary to seed genetics. They provide a different mode of action when they combine to a trait, for effective protection against insects or against nematodes, in, the case, uh, in, in this case, of pests. But let's not forget that we don't have yet genetics and traits for every pest out there. And then, really, the seed treatment can kick in and provide that protection. Also, because of how they're applied right there on that seed, the seed treatment protects the seed as soon as it hits the ground and then continues to protect it in those critical early stages of the plant's growth. So the benefits that have made seed treatments a product of choice nowadays um, for growers in the U.S. If you talk about corn, for example, say 99% of corn receives the seed applied insecticide, and in some of it's about 50%. And this number we see growing year in, year out. Um, also, let's not forget that for soybeans, the grower has to make that decision in most cases when he's going to his retailer and making that decision of which genetic, which variety that he's going to plant, he's going to have to make that decision of which seed treatment he wants applied on. It. So definitely growers see and understand better and better the value of that seed treatment and therefore continue to ask for it. So I've drawn up a list here of the main available seed treatments for both corn and soybean uh, across the industry from the different providers. Uh, for today, I'm concentrating on corn and soy a matter of time, but if there are questions in other crops, there are also a lot of products available um, for pretty much all crops because 
unfortunately, all commercial crops grown in the U.S. Um, are subject to insect pressure. So let's talk about corn. And again, it's been a mild winter overall so far, and this could lead to a spring with increased insect pressure. It's hard to say which is going to be the pest of the year 2016. I didn't bring my crystal ball with me, but likely to be different according to different geographies. The corn rootworm, uh, Dwayne talked a lot about it, and um, I also want to talk about corn rootworm because that is definitely for corn growers a problem that they need to deal with uh, very often. So corn rootworm, um, different types of corn rootworm, as Dwayne explained, but they can be found, um, you find one or the other type, <clears throat> pretty much in all corn growing areas of the U.S. They can highly impact the yield as they damage the roots. And depending on the, pr the pressure, they can affect nutrient uptake. They can even lead to plant lodging. We touched on it already in the first presentation, but management of corn rootworms really needs to be looked at a holistic approach. There's no one solution that will provide on a long-term base the protection that the grower needs against this pest. Crop rotation, genetics, soil insecticides, and seed treatments <clears throat> should all be considered to fight corn root worms. So one example um, from bigger crop science is Poncho 1250 Votino. And that is definitely a solution that growers should include and consider in their corn root worm toolbox. With the higher rate of Poncho that, that it delivers to the seed, Poncho 1250 plus Votivo provides the protection against corn rootworm at low to moderate pest pressure. It also protects the corn seedling against bill bugs, wireworms, black cutworms, other uh, early season insects. Um, we tend to call them secondary insects, but I find them as important to yield as the corn rootworm at the end of the day. That protection comes from the poncho component of poncho 1250 Votivo. It's a systemic insecticide. Um, you can see it on the little graph here. We tried to depict how the two different products work but it um, really starts traveling throughout that plant from when that seed germinates. And it's going to protect um, against below and above ground insects. We also have the Votivo component. So Votivo is a broad spectrum biological nematode protector. Um, it actually germinates when the seed germinates. And as you can see on the diagram, it doesn't create these little green roots, but it colonizes the root as they grow away from the seed zone and offers long-lasting nematode protection. So together, Poncho Votivo, um, Poncho 1250, and Votivo, they offer healthier stands, larger yields, and we've been testing this product that's been on the market now for, for the last five years, and uh, over all the testing we've done, independent university and our own trials, we see a 10 to 14 bushel yield increase from using Poncho 1250 Votivo versus the standard fungicide system. And that's an average. So imagine this is a product that's really targeted at corn rootworm. Uh, in those areas that are more sens sensible to corn rootworm, those yield benefits could even be expected to be, to be higher. So we'll switch to soybeans now because I think that's also an important um, crop for those people who joined today. On soybeans, the number one problem and the number one yield robber is the soybean fifth unit with an average annual yield loss yield loss of 120 million bushels. Now, technically, nematodes are not an insect, but oftentimes they're put into the insect category, um, probably because they look like worms, very tiny worms. And that's again, uh, has been documented in almost every state where soybeans are grown. Um, it can cause quite severe yield loss. Um, you can see it here. And, um, and they attack and they feed on a soybean's plant root system. If you add to that problem, SDS, soybean uh, sun death syndrome, sorry, you're now looking at two of the top five yield robbers in the U.S. 2014, for example, was a pretty high SDS outbreak here, and these two problems together accounted for over 186 million bushels of yield loss. So, yeah, this is an insecticide um, webinar, and I'm all of a sudden talking about diseases, but it's important to talk about these two together. First of all, they're found in the same region. Um, and farmers also often link the two problems. Now, the two problems are independent, but we know that roots that are damaged by soybean seed nematode are more, um, are more, there are more chances, sorry, that the disease that will create the foliar symptoms of SDS can enter that root and affect the plant. 
So like for pro rootworm in corn or, or even herbicides, an integrated pest management program should be considered. Um, it starts with the selection of color and variety, which should be adapted to your area, but you should also consider seed treatments. Seed treatments can provide you with a wider choice of variety, so maybe um, you know, you're checking with your local retailer, oh, well, I'd like to do that variety, but it's a little bit less tolerant than that one. Well, maybe the seed treatment can come in and protect that, make that difference that'll allow you to take that variety that'll bring the best yield in your field while still getting through the seed treatment that production that you need. Um, but also, if nematodes develop resistance to the trait, the seed treatments can assist in fighting the problem and maintain trait efficacy for a longer time. So for soybean cyst nematodes, um, and for SDS, we now have a solution for growers in the U.S., and that is our Poncho Latino and Olivo Triple Action Protection. It's a great tool for growers, protect their plants, and by that, maximize their yields. So Triple Action, again, I try to, try to put together a little diagram to depict how that works. We're now talking about three different components. We've got Poncho, again, our systemic insecticide. Same product as we had in the uh, corn poncho 1250 Votivo. And that is really going to give us the above and below ground quick protection um, against those pests. It, it's, uh, it ranges from, from aphids to bean leaf beetle, a uh, green leaf beetle, sorry, um, providing that protection. Now we're introducing two modes of action against nematodes, two modes of, the, of action against soybean cyst nematodes, but also all the other nematodes that affect the soybean plant. Those two modes of action are Votivo. Again, it works similarly to the way it works on corn, protecting, uh, creating that living barrier around the root. And then Olivo, which is a, a, a true nematicide, it'll kill the nematodes in the seed zone. They're killing them fast right there, and as the root system grows away from the seed zone, that's really where the Votivo kicks in and offers that second protection. And then last but not least, the Levo also provides protection against the fungus that um, is responsible for sun death syndrome. Let's not forget that Votivo, on top of what it brings in terms of nematode protection, Votivo is also a plant health promoter. So it creates, um, it, it, it really promotes that young growth of the plant. And at the end of the season, that's what is most important, creates those um, options for higher yield. So what does that mean for a grower? Um, 2015 was the, um, the first year where, uh, when the product was available to soybean growers, and there were a lot of field trials. I'm sure a lot of you uh, heard a lot of things about um, the rate, uh, the yield response already of uh, sponsored with people on Olivo. It was 6.5 bushels per acre that we observed when above ground symptoms of SDS um, were, were occurring, and it was 2.9 bushels per acre on average that was observed with little or no above ground symptoms. That's real yield, and that's the kind of value that seed treatments bring to the table. So there, again, we believe that there's no silver, silver bullet for most of the pests that affect growers uh, in, in the country. And as the value of the seed continues to grow, it's important to be able to protect that investment and allow growers to have um, real solutions. So again, genetics, seed treatments, crop rotations, um, even in thorough and foliar spray, all of these should be looked at um, together. That's what best management practices are. Um, we, need, we have good solutions. Uh, we have options, but we need to combine these tools depending on you know, different growing conditions in order to maximize yield potential and in order to keep the efficiency of these products for as long as possible. Because at the end of the day, it's all about yield. It's all about being able to, um, on the same set of, pretty much the same set of arable land we have today, continuing to be able to grow more crops and being able to um, consistently show that difference and that protection against the insects. On that note, I'd like to thank everybody, and uh, we can move to the Q&A session. Greg, thanks very much for that. I appreciate that. That was well done. Uh, to both of you gentlemen, I know you can't hear it, but our audience is clapping very loudly for you, so well done. Um, I, I think we now want to drift into some, some questions, 
and uh, and I'm going to fire some out to you. And I, I want to start with Greg, or pardon me, with Dwayne. Uh, give Greg a chance to catch his breath. Greg, can you talk, or Dwayne, can you talk a little bit about um, what the retailers need to keep in mind as they're uh, recommending traits to the producers? Sure, Sean. Uh, from a retail standpoint, uh, as they're meeting with growers or have been meeting with growers, they're 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 recommending the best genetics uh, for these fields. And basically, I would tell everyone to, again, look at that field history and try to assess the risk of what type of rootworm population they have and, and, look at that, and look at that scenario. You start looking at the BMPs you want to bring into, what are the, what are the potential considerations that that grower management system can adopt? Not everyone can adopt all strategies due to equipment limitations, uh, need for feed, and things like that. We've got to be able to look and see what's available and then consider, you know, realistically, what can we do with, at this time point? Because this, this kind of one of those time frames where we're getting, you know, it's January, but we'll be pulling planters out before long. So there's not a lot we can do, but what, at this point, what can we do? But then think about what kind of plan do we put in place to evaluate in 2016 what we're dealing with. So we can't change anything now. If it's everything said and done, then what would we need to do this season to assess the need for 2017? I mean, it's kind of the most building blocks. You've got to understand what you have to make a plan to, to execute the plan. So that's kind of, I hope that answered the question of the, uh, of the person asking it. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to throw one more at you, too. Um, has the approval process begun on SmartStacks Pro? And uh, will this, is there, is there any delays or what, what timing? What, what, what do you see with that? So the regulatory process is uh, very complicated. Um, uh, everything is pretty much close to a submission point. So we, there's been, I can't get any read on delays or anything like that. The single event for Rootworm 3, that's the, the Mon 8741, um, is within the EPA, and, and there's been uh, some submissions to China. Um, everything right now is on target. So there's been no delays. There's going to be additional requirements, things of that nature. But I would just say, all we can do is right now is protect what we currently have, deal with what we have, and then be excited about a new tool here at the end of the decade. Um, let's, not, let's not wait and change our strategies uh, and wait for the new technology. We need to do something now, though, okay? Yeah. Uh, agreed. Agreed. And that, that kind of comes back to this whole idea of pipeline. Um, and, and, and while we want to be talking pipeline, we, we don't want to uh, analyze ourselves into paralysis. We need to be uh, acting today. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well said, Dwayne. Um, Greg, you got your breath back over there? Yes, sir. Yeah, excellent. Um, Greg, wanted to just touch base with you. Um, when when you were talking about one of the questions that came up, when you were talking about uh, the, the Poncho 1250, can you talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the expectancy? How, how do you see that product rolling out in the future? Is that going to continue to maintain its efficacy? Well, so far we, uh, we we haven't seen any shift in the response of uh, of, of insects to to poncho, uh, the mm -hmm. insecticide portion of, of this product. Now, you know, we are Bayer globally um, spends about a billion dollars every year on research and development, and core rootworm, like most, like all the other major pests, are definitely part of our research target. So we're we're always trying to find new solutions, bring new new um, innovation to the market. Sancho Botivo has been on the market for about five years now, and uh, we're, we're definitely working on, you know, what what is our next generation um, of Poncho Botivo kind of kind of bring to growers in the U.S. Um, we've also um, had a couple of acquisitions recently, and uh, and like a lot of other people, really looking at. What can the world of biologics continue to bring to growers in terms of additional yield potential um, and even maybe other other effects maybe um, against funguses or, or even insects? So there's a, there's a lot being looked at, and uh, I think there, there could be some exciting new things coming to the market in the next couple of years. Excellent. Um, I'm going to frame up, a, I think the question as I'm interpreting it as it's being written here is, is similar to the one to Dwayne. Can, can you talk a little bit about what retailers, I mean, seed treatments uh, continue to grow as, as a market, certainly. 
Can you talk a little bit about what the retailers need to be thinking about as they're making recommendations to their growers? Well, so, you know, I think they should always look at, at the specifics of the grower, specifics of a region, um, university extensions, agronomic advisors uh, can be a really big help in terms of providing the right uh, recommendation for the right grower. Again, it's about, okay, picking the right trait. That's what you start off with. And then how do you complement it? What kind of seed treatment do you want to offer the grower, recommend the grower uses to complete this package? And, and, you know, there's been such an increase in the value of seed over the last years. And, and it's normal because that seed is bringing up more and more and more. But having that extra protection on it to ensure that it's going to thrive to its full genetic potential is, I think, something that um, we as, you know, the retail or the manufacturers, distributors are, um, have to take a key role in explaining everything a grower is getting on his seat. Excellent. Excellent. Gentlemen, you know what? We are bumping right up against our time here. And I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank you both for sharing your insights. I really appreciate your time. I want to remind our audience that, um, A, we thank our sponsors, again, uh, BASF and Bear Crop Science for their support of this webinar series. Um, I also want to quickly thank the team working behind the scenes for their dedication to making this uh, a, a real informative event. This, uh, this um, webinar is recorded, and we, you'll be able to hear it again on SeedWorld.com. We're going to answer any and all questions that come through now or in the future. You'll be, be sure to get an answer back out to you. So a huge thanks again to our audience. And, gentlemen, thank you very much for sharing your time. Thank you. Great thank you very much. much.